Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell from Victoria University in Australia. Today I'm bringing to you Professor Julian Zarath from uh, actually two places. So her main position is at the Karolinska Institute, uh, where she has a senior position there. And also she's at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. So, you know, across two universities um, in two different countries with senior roles in both. So she um, heads up an institute at the uh, University of Copenhagen as well. And Julian has a very interesting background. I mean, that's interesting enough already. But um, as part of her role at Karolinska Institute, she was actually uh, voted by her peers to, at one stage, be the chair of the Nobel Prize Committee. So I think that's pretty remarkable. Um, Julian's, you know, as you'll see, very modest about that. But I think it's quite remarkable for someone who's an exercise physiologist, who, um, like myself, was at Ball State University in Indiana um, with David Costor. Um, during her masters, and you'll and you'll see this is the second out of three in a row of people that are associated with Paul State University. To go from that um, through to these um, amazingly, um, you know, prestigious uh, university roles, and then to you know chair the, the um, Nobel Prize Committee, I think it's pretty amazing. But um, yeah, Julian has a uh, very impressive background in exercise research. Her main interest is insulin sensitivity in muscle, and how that is uh, reduced with diabetes and also how this can be improved with exercise. And um, she's looked at all sorts of things and uh, of late has been looking at circadian rhythms. So the effect of um, you know, the time of day, um, shift work, um, you know, changing time zones when you, when you fly, for example, on your metabolism, um, similarities and differences between people with type two diabetes and people with, uh, that don't have diabetes, um, how exercise can impact on this, um, also the effect of uh, the time of day on exercise, metabolism and performance. So I think it's a, a really important uh, really important and interesting chat. So uh, stick around. Uh, hi, Julene. Thank you very much for coming on Inside Exercise. How are you? It's great to be here. Yeah, great to be here. Glad we can actually get this uh, together, this time together. And we're on the same day, the same calendar. That's exactly days. right. <laughs> so it's 6 p.m. for me. And it's, I think it's, you said it's 10 a.m. for you. That's now, right. 10 a.m. Yep. But now the you, weather's really different. Here it's zero degrees. It's probably warm and sunny by you. Oh, uh, it's not too bad. But yeah, it's definitely warmer than that. Um, so you get around a lot. And that's partly what I wanted, wanted to talk about is um, you've got, you know, you head up a lab in, in Karolinska Institute in Sweden, but also at the University of Copenhagen. Now, what I'm interested in is where are you actually? And at the moment, and how did you actually end up? You're an American. How did you end up? Which I, I, I think that's right. You are an American. How did you end up on that side of the woods and doing so well? So I'm right now, I'm at the Karolinska in mm -hmm. Stockholm, Sweden, and that's my base. Um, I live in Sweden. I live in Stockholm or an island in the suburb of Stockholm. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been primarily at the Karolinska since 1989. Um, and I came over to do my PhD work. I mean, you and I have had some parallels in our careers. Um, I started mm -hmm. my career at the University of Wisconsin at uh, River Falls. And there I studied um, physical education and in teaching. And in parallel, I did a degree in business administration, actually. So it was two different, two different tracks. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went to Ball State yes. in Muncie, Indiana, mm -hmm. and did a master's there. And that was great. That was really a lot of fun. And from there, I went to Wash U and I worked with John Halazi mm -hmm. as um, a research assistant in, in his lab. And that was a pretty phenomenal environment because John had like the uh, downstairs lab where a lot of the work was focused on mechanisms um, controlling glucose transport in muscle and how exercise can promote glucose uptake by an insulin independent effect. And that was before we even had the glu the glucose transporters in the hands, you know? Mm -hmm. And then John had this upstairs lab where it was really applied physiology and clinical physiology. And a lot of the work there was translating what we did in the downstairs lab where I worked to the upstairs lab where John was working with people with diabetes and people of different ages and trying to understand the health promoting benefits of exercise. And I think probably inspired by David Costell, actually at Ball State, I really learned a lot about the Scandinavian researchers 
and PO Ostrand and Bank Saltine and all these great, you know, Scandinavian um, physiologists. And in Halazi's lab, um, Harriet Walbrook Henriksen was there and she was working on glucose uptake. And I just figured, why don't I go to Scandinavian? You know, Abe Katz had done that. Abe Katz mm -hmm. had been at uh, Ball State. Yep. And he went over and did a PhD with um, Kent Saline. And, mm -hmm. and Eric Eric Holtman, you know. And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, you know, I talked to Abe a lot about that and thought, well, you know, if Abe had done that, and he really, really was promoting the Scandinavian uh, research environment. So I did my PhD at the Karolinska around John Warren and his team and Harriet Wahlberg Henriksen. And then from there, I went to Boston and did a postdoc with Barbara Kahn at Beth wow. Israel Deaconess, Harvard mm -hmm. Medical School. You've had some and that good was background there. Really <laughs> phenomenal yeah. environment to be in yeah. because, you know, sitting there every single time, you know, every day we had a seminar that we went to and it was usually research that was going to be published a couple of years later so you were every day of, you had a seminar wow well you mm. know there was things that environment mm. is so rich you could have a seminar at the Joslin or there could be one at yeah, Beth Israel Deaconess or Mass General I mean so there was so much so much um, emphasis on what's coming up you know so that was really a rich environment and then from there I went back to Sweden and I worked a little bit in Denmark at the Hagerdon Research Institute that was run by um de Metz, and that was focused more on insulin signaling and insulin action and the genetics of diabetes. And um, started my own lab at the Karolinska um, mm. in 1996, 96. So pretty much there. And then how did I get to Copenhagen? I mean, in yeah. 2009, the Dean of the Faculty of Health at the University of Copenhagen invited me uh, to join a proposal. We were writing a proposal together with Olaf Peterson, Tui Schwartz, uh, and Jen Zules Holst. And that idea was to set up a center for basic metabolic research. And that was funded in 2010. So from 2010, I've been working um, part time at the University of Copenhagen, initially as a, a scientific director, and now I'm the executive director of that center since 2017. So I kind of divide up my days between, you know, my research at KI and running the center in Copenhagen. And I have a team of postdocs there. In fact, we just got off a Zoom call where we mm. were discussing uh, mitophagy. Uh, in okay, the wow. So so we kind of started off similar because I you know, I was at Ball State, yeah. I think you're alluding to with David Costell, which is amazing. And the, and the number of people that have just been on this podcast, you know, so Andy Coggan was the first one on. He was there. Mark Hargraves, um, yourself. Hang on, I'm having a mental play. Uh, 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 John, John Hawley. Uh, uh, John Hawley. Yeah. Brett Goodpastner. Pretty sure mm -hmm. he was, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. John Holly and I were contemporaries, and John Kerwin was there, and he was a postdoc. We were there at the same time. Daryl Newfer was there at the same time. Yes, he's on my list. Um, I'm trying to think. It was a really strong group of people. I mean, it was just phenomenal to be there. Um, and 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 it's fun to see how well all my colleagues have done. Oh my god, you know, they've all gone on and they've really done fantastic things. Well, that's the thing. I've had everyone pretty much has come on and said yes that I've asked um, that from that went to Ball State except David Costor. <laughs> I can't get the great man onto myself. He'd be great, and he comes up probably every second podcast. So um, he was so inspiring. I mean, he oh was gosh. just always so enthusiastic, you know, and he was just um, and such a sense a real, of humor. As well. Yeah, a real character. I just loved his energy, and he had a way of taking these complex questions and distilling mm -hmm. them down to things that really mattered for people that were trying to improve performance. I'll tell you a funny line. So, so I did my master's with, with Dave, and then I came back and did my PhD with Mark Hargraves and David Costell came down. I was telling um, Michael Jorner about this last week and we VO2 max tested this guy, Derek Clayton, who had the world best marathon time in 1969. We VO2 max tested him in 1990 and I was in charge of the Douglas bags in many ways. And it was stressful, but we got it done. But the point was, um, my my we had this evening together, and my mum came out, and she was just like, "Ah, oh, it was so wonderful! You changed Glenn's life." And he, you know, and he said, "Life? What life? He should be back. At, he should be in the lab. He's a PhD student." <laughs> like, it's just the sense of humor, you know. All right, now yeah. the other thing is, and this is amazing. I was thinking about this earlier. So with Mark Hargroves, he was at Melbourne Uni, and then he moved to Deakin, and he actually said, because he was in a medical school there. He said, I'll never make full professor. 
in this in, in a medical school as an exercise physiologist. Mm -hmm. And then that's the only time I know that he was wrong because he actually did come mm -hmm. back to Melbourne Uni as a professor. So the interesting thing, and this is the reason for me saying this, is that you ended up the chair of the Nobel Prize Committee in Medicine as an exercise physiologist, which is pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why don't you tell us a bit about that? You would actually ring up the people to congratulate them, is that right? To tell no, them. I, I'm not the one that actually rings them up. So oh, okay. yeah, well, first of all, all right. So first of all, the um, Alfred Nobel was really clear in his will that the Nobel Prize should be for physiology or medicine should be um, decided by a jury um, of professors at the Karolinska Institute. At, and so um, initially there were, you know, all the professors at Karolinska Institute that were on this jury. And um, now we have a, a jury called the Nobel Assembly, and that's 50 professors at the Karolinska Institute. And so um, I was uh, elected into that assembly by my peers. Mm -hmm. And um, from that assembly, which is 50 members, they're the voting body of the prize. Um, there's a working body called the Nobel Committee. And um, I was elected into that committee, and it's a two times three year term. And during that term, um, one year I was the vice chair, and for three years I was the chair of the of the committee. Uh, and and basically, the job of the chair of the committee is to really organize the work. Every year we get newly nominated candidates. Every year we start like with a clean slate, so the individuals have to be nominated in the year to be considered for the prize for that year. Mm -hmm. So we have. Um, several hundred individuals that are nominated every year. And we go through the nominations and, um, you know, we will get opinions um, from external re referees or, you know, reviewers. We'll, we'll ask our colleagues out in the world to give us an opinion about the individuals who've been nominated and we have to award a discovery. So we have to be certain that the individual who is nominated has made a discovery and that they are the person that made the discovery. Mm. And we generally look to see whether or not that discovery is a new paradigm or paradigm shifting. Um, and clearly it has to be related to physiology or medicine. And so the job of the chair is to organize the work and um, the committee then puts up a recommendation of the potential candidate or candidates for the prize for that year. And the assembly is the body that votes um, on who will be rewarded the prize. And the Secretary General, um, he is really organizing all the work. That's Professor Thomas Perlman. And he's the person who contacts the laureates and makes sure that um, everything around their visit is working in a good way. And, um, you know, he, he's the, I could say he's the Secretary General of the whole whole organization. Well, I still think it's pretty impressive that you ended up being chair of that committee. And uh, I, I must get my stories wrong. I, you told me at one stage about re someone rang up someone and they went there or there's some, something about it. was a funny story. Yeah, there, well, I can't remember that's what it was. long before my time. Long yeah. before my time, uh, okay. Professor Jan Lindstein was the secretary general and he um, he rang up one of the laureates. The hardest thing is to find their telephone numbers because, you know, it, you can't nominate yourself. You have to be nominated by someone else. And mm -hmm. we don't usually have people's home addresses or home phone numbers. And uh, mm -hmm. we don't, we don't, we actually don't contact anyone until, well, we vote on the first Monday of October. Mm -hmm. And so it really is only then that we're clear that we have the, the laureates. And we vote around nine or 10 o'clock in the morning, Swedish time. And a couple hours later, we'll contact the laureates and uh, inform them of the decision wow. by the assembly. And so finding the phone number is always really difficult. And so one, I think one year, uh, Professor Lindstein uh, rang up the laureate that year and got a phone answering machine. And uh, he said it was a gruff sounding man. <laughs> And Jan Lindstein informed the phone machine who he was and why he was calling and uh, hung up the phone. And then he called the other laureate who was the co-recipient of the prize that year and said, you know, I just talked to your colleague uh, and he wanted to double check the number. And the other laureate had said, no, that's not the right number. Here's the right number. Oh, <laughs> so my gosh. Call back the phone machine. And Some said, random yeah, guy one. And again, and I just am calling to tell you that unfortunately you're not receiving the Nobel Prize this year. And then he called the, <laughs> the 
the true recipient and made it all I'm right. I'm assuming so. that first person was not a medical researcher, at least. They might have been I don't like think a, so. a lumberjack. I'm or not something. sure what he was doing. It would have been bad if they were a medical researcher. He and might have been. Jan Lindstein funny. said he sounded like a construction worker. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I'm glad. Who knows what he was doing? Hey, all right. So we're going to talk about circadian rhythms, exercise, and type 2 diabetes today, yeah? So um, as, as you said, you've, you've had a background or, uh, of, of looking at a whole bunch of stuff. So we've, we've crossed paths a couple of times with some of the stuff with glucose uptake, AMPK. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted mm -hmm. to say, I think the last time I saw you was on a tram in Amsterdam. I think it was, yeah. yeah, an exercise metabolism. We conference. sat next to each other for dinner, I thought. Uh, that's right. And I was saying how I was having yeah, trouble yeah. getting my papers reviewed because I was saying stuff about AMPK that didn't fit with the um, party line or something. And uh, I think you may have been, because you were uh, at the time, um, anyway, I think you might have helped me out a little bit there with, with assigning something or who knows, <laughs> who knows, who knows. Okay. All right. So um, let's talk about this. So how about we start off talking about uh, circadian rhythms and type two diabetes and then maybe, um, you know, circadian biology and timing of exercise or the other way around. What do you reckon? Yeah. So how, how well, does, I'm really, uh, I, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, well, I'm really interested in insulin sensitivity. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm really interested in um, understanding how muscle cells become insulin resistant. And I'm interested in how exercise can um, help muscle cells remain insulin sensitive. So I'm really interested in that question. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in that in the context of type two diabetes and obesity. Yep. Um, sure. And the other thing that I've become really interested in is rhythms and rhythms in metabolism. And um, I think it's just fascinating, you know, mm. that there are these intrinsic clocks that can control metabolism in a diurnal manner. And um, I, to some extent, I think that biology is understudied. Um, to some extent, obviously, there was a Nobel Prize for, the, um, you know, elucidating this molecular circadian clock. So clearly, this is an mm -hmm. area of research that's really important. But um, it's it's hard to study, and it's difficult to study because it requires uh, an investigation of biology over the fourth dimension, the time dimension. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I suppose, if you think about it, the endocrinologists understood rhythms and metabolism when they got the RIA because they could study hormones, they could study circulating factors over the course of a, of a day. You know, they could do this by blood sampling and you could see these diurnal changes in hormones such as insulin or stress hormones, et cetera. And we know that many of these hormones are um, interacting with the core clock machinery and they can fine tune or they can reset these clocks. They can be zeitgeibers, they can be timekeepers. And we know that there's changes in our physiology over the day, changes in blood pressure, there's changes in um, alertness, changes in heart rate, body um, temperature. you know, we, yeah, mm -hmm. body temperature. And, and, mm -hmm. and in terms of sports performance, you know, there's times of the day where we're stronger, usually afternoons and greater alertness in the morning. So I was just interested in how do you actually put that whole time spectrum onto the daily changes we see in metabolism. And then the next question I really wanted to bring forward was, could we then somehow utilize the environment exercise to interact with these, this clock machinery? And could we use exercise to fine tune or maybe reset some of these circadian clocks? Could exercise be a zeitgeber? Mm -hmm. And would that be a way in which we could you know, restore rhythms in metabolic diseases, because we know that, you know, if you think about this metabolic flexibility, this was um, Brian, um, Kelly and coworkers, they talk about these changes in um, substrate switching throughout the day. And, and people who have normal glucose tolerance um, are very metabolically flexible and people who are have diabetes are metabolically inflexible. So there's a rhythm in metabolism. So can you use exercise to kind of uh, reset that rhythm. And that's mm -hmm. kind of how, how I came into these questions. And initially I um, contacted Paolo Sassoni Corse, who uh, has passed away, but he's um, been a real, you know, major force in circadian biology related to metabolism. And, and then uh, I contact John Hawley, uh, who obviously, as you know, works a lot on performance aspects. 
and uh, Harriet Wahlberg Henriksen, and we put together a grant to ask whether or not we could fine tune um, the circadian machinery and metabolism by exercise and diet. So that's kind of how we got into these questions. Yeah, it's good you mentioned diet right then, because I was thinking, you know how you say it's a little bit hard to study, because it... I don't know if you know, we did a study looking at like shift work, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, you sort of go, well, how much of the effect of the shift work on insulin sensitivity, sensitivity for example, is the fact that they're eating at different times or they mm -hmm. eat, might be eating, tending to eat more fatty foods and, and mm -hmm. you know, they're not as active and they're not sleeping as well. And, you know, so it sort of becomes complicated, but we'll probably get to that later. It's complex. So, yeah. I think that's <laughs> the word. It's very complex yeah. because clearly, clearly nutrients, yeah. Uh, metabolites and hormones can mm. interact with this clock machinery for sure. So, so yeah, I was think, wondering if we could set the the scene a little bit for people. So, how much of how much of what's going on is this sort of the clock? So, if you maybe explain how there's like clocks within cells, and it's not just you know the the brain's releasing melatonin because people know about melatonin and things like that. I wonder if you can just set the scene a little bit about how there's like the central control with melatonin and nerves and then there's also the this the peripherals and how they interact you know it's complicated I right guess. so nearly every cell in the body has an intrinsic molecular clock mm -hmm. and you could think about it in this way that all organs then have a clock so there's the central clock and the suprachiasmatic nuclei here and that is the clock that is sensitive to light and you know, obviously that is getting light cues and the light is one of the biggest zeitgeivers we have. And that central clock is sort of, if you think of an orchestra, that central clock is the conductor of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you think of muscle and liver and fat and bone, all the organs, mm -hmm. that's the players in the orchestra, the violins, mm -hmm. the cellos, you know, the, the clarinets. And so the central clock somehow coordinates and synchronizes all of the peripheral clocks. But the peripheral clocks can be also affected by hormones and nutrients and, you know, exercise, what you do. And um, these clocks, they're what they're called is a transcription translation feedback loop. And what that means is that they are um, oscillating throughout the day and they have an activating arm that turns on the expression of genes and they have a repressing arm that shuts off the expression of genes. Mm -hmm. And so they're producing transcripts that can, you know, lead to the production of proteins that can control metabolic processes or biological processes. And it turns out thousands of genes that are controlled by the clock are related to metabolism and growth. And so it's one way in which the body can regulate metabolic and growth processes. Yep. And, and is, is it true that just like I was thinking about how, you know, if you, it's, it's a bit gross for some people, but you know, if you, if you kill a rat or a mouse, you take its heart out, it's still beating you. It's the same sort of thing with the, the, the clocks. You can change your central. Yeah. But, but your peripheral may be still ticking away and have a different sort of time course. Is that, is that your understanding as well? Well, I mean, every cell in the body has this clock. And so mm -hmm. hormones and nutrients can synchronize the clock so they're aligned, so they can be working in concert. So you're right. If you would take a muscle biopsy from me or you and make primary, you know, mm -hmm. myotube cultures, every one of those cells has got their own clock yes. and they're not really aligned. And so what we use in the dish is we can synchronize these clocks in these myotubes by using um, serum shock, for example. And then all the clocks are aligned. They get oh, reset. Hmm, they get reset and they get aligned. And that hmm. in some ways is what the central clock can help to do is to realign all the clocks in the body. And I suppose it's like when you travel, right? You get yes. jet lagged and your mm -hmm. clocks, there's a mismatch between the clock, um, the peripheral clocks and the central clock. And it almost takes one day for every hour of time change. Uh, before these clocks can be realigned. And so it takes a little bit of time before the light cues can start to realign clocks when you have time changes through seasonal changes or traveling. Okay, great. So um, I often think about um, animal versus human models. How how good are the animals? So obviously a lot of that stuff with the Nobel Prize, et cetera, would be using 
you know, a lot of stuff would have gone into it. But well, that was out, flies. Genes, Actually, no, they were they they studied flies. Okay, so go. that that's that they 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 basically studied flies and they snipped off the head of the fly. So they studied the the brain, if you could say it. They, they studied the heads of flies. And, but I mean, and, all right, so why mice? You know, and mm-hmm. if you think about it, most, um, you know, the genome of mouse and human is really similar. Um, clearly, there's differences between mice and humans. But, you know, mice have brains, they have hearts, they have cardiovascular systems, they have a skeletal system. So many of the uh, biological, the organs are very mm-hmm. similar to humans. Yep. And, um, yep. you know, a lot of the biological processes are very similar as well. And so a mouse is a good model. Um, obviously, we one should strive to do as much work as one can do in, in humans, obviously. But certain things you can't do in humans as well, like, you know, take the hypothalamus of a human and grind exactly. it up and study it. I mean, I, you're not going to get my hypothalamus, right? So mice are really good models. And then obviously you want to try to translate as much of that biology to to humans as possible. Yeah, so a lot of the stuff we've done sort of knock, knocking out clock the clock genes and things, which you obviously can't do in humans. But do, do you no. find, does the research find that things go hand in hand generally, that, that what's found, so with the clock regulation, I know it's a bit tricky because they're nocturnal, well, but yeah. No, but the thing here is that this clock machinery is evolutionarily conserved. It's pretty remarkable, actually. So in that respect, I think that it's an evolutionarily conserved biology. And um, you're right, mice are uh, nocturnal. So they're active during the dark cycle and sleeping during the light cycle. So there's differences. Um, there's certainly differences in the way metabolism is you know, performed in a mouse. Mice are very hepatocentric. They have, there's a lot of reliance on the liver in a mouse. Mm-hmm. Um, the melatonin axis is different in mice and humans, but it, you know, it's a good model to study. Yeah. And I guess the good thing in our lab is that we really can study people. You exactly. know, we're, we're, so in my, our lab is um, a distinct in that we're able to study um, molecules. We're able to study cells. We study primary cultures and immortalized cell lines. We study organs. We can take an organ out of a human or an animal and we can study it in a dish. Uh, we study mouse models where we can genetically modify the mouse to ask whether or not a particular factor is important for metabolism or the development of diabetes. And we have um, a clinical la- a clinical lab where we're bringing folks into the lab and we're doing uh, intervention studies. And um, we're actually asking some of these questions about time of day of exercise in people who have normal glucose tolerance or people who are diabetic, people who have type 2 diabetes. Yeah, I think it's perfect. I mean, that's, 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 I mean, again, we had similar, I didn't have as much success as you, but um, yeah, doing as much as you can in humans and then, and then you yeah. try and supplement it with animals and things, which, which doesn't always happen in a lot of labs. Um, yeah. yeah. So what I want to talk about there is, is what does happen then if we talk about, um, um, what happens to insulin sensitivity in these people with type 2 diabetes, you know, with, you know, circadian change? Like what, what is going wrong there with them that is related to circadian rhythms, for example? Well, I mean, right, there's, I, I guess the, the real answer is we don't know, you know, so I'm going to, I'm going to say we don't know um, mm. why there are some circadian misalignments in people with diabetes or obesity. And, um, I don't necessarily think it's genetic per se, because <clears throat> clock genes haven't really come up as being genes that are primarily responsible for the development of diabetes or obesity. But I think some of it might be related to some environmental factors. Um, I think some of it might be related to um, food intake. We talked about that earlier yeah. and um exercise or the lack of exercise for some people. Clearly, I do believe there's a genetic component to the development of diabetes and obesity. I, I strongly believe that that genes play a big role in determining or influencing whether or not an individual will um, uh, develop obesity or diabetes or insulin resistance. I believe in that. But I also believe that the environment can strongly influence um, the course to the development of these cardiometabolic diseases. And so, um, you know, sleep patterns can affect 
our metabolism. Mm -hmm. So if we have really disturbed sleep patterns that can affect this, um, obviously people who are eating into the late hours of the evening, that can definitely put a strain on our metabolism. And in some cases that can lead to increased levels of glycemia, or blood sugar over the night, which can put a stress on our liver and our islet mm -hmm. cells. Um, and also a lack of physical activity. So I think that these things are somehow all collaborating together um, and, with and, this clock and affecting yeah. our overall metabolism. They, as you say, it's always very difficult to say, like, you know, if, if a, di a person with diabetes or obese has re reduced insulin sensitivity, obviously, you know, how much of it is because they're not as active? How much is it because, you know, they, yeah. they who knows, they have depression, even maybe sleep problems, dietary problems. But I did see, I think you had a paper, disrupted circadian oscillations in type 2 diabetes are linked to altered rhythmic mitochondrial metabolism. So there yeah, is that was actually, true. yeah, there is actually yeah. disrupted oscillations in people. So if you have controls and people type 2 diabetes, you can see. So I can see tell difference. you about that study. Yeah. So in that particular work, Brendan Gabriel and Ali Alantas were the drivers of that work. And we um, started out by studying primary muscle cells from people who have normal glucose tolerance or people who have type 2 diabetes. And so we took biopsies and we uh, you know, extracted satellite cells and we grew them in a dish and we could differentiate um, myotubes, uh, myoblasts into myotubes. And we studied these myotube cultures over 54 hours and we sampled them every four hours. And what Brendan and Ali could show was when they measured um, oxygen consumption, there was a rhythm in the rate of oxygen consumption in the myotube cultures that was circadian. And that rhythm was um, dampened in the myotube mm -hmm. cultures from the people with diabetes, which was surprising. Yeah. And it is a bit similar to what Patrick Schron has seen in muscle biopsies from healthy people. He sees a rhythm in oxygen consumption rates. And then we did RNA sequencing of the cultures over these 54 hours, which was just pretty massive. And mm -hmm. um, we could see that 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 many of the, the genes that oscillate in a circadian fashion, there was, um, you can argue that there was a dampening of that oscillation. The peaks and the troughs of the changes in the gene expression was dampened in the cu cultures mm -hmm. from people with diabetes. Mm -hmm. And so that, in that, implied that there was sort of an intrinsic um, change in the oxygen consumption that was coupled to the clock in myotube cultures. And so it was something outside of the body. So that could either be an epigenetic phenomenon, um, but somehow these muscle cultures had a memory for these changes. And that's mm. actually what we're trying to work on now in the lab is trying to understand why. We don't know why. We're trying to figure that out. And I wonder if you can, if you then uh, exercise these people and then got now, so you know how the the myotubes maintain their glucose, so that people with diabetes have less insulin stimulated glucose uptake in the myotubes as well, right? I wonder right. if you exercise. Has anyone looked at that? There's, I think they have actually. If you exercise people and then look at their myotubes, do you see greater insulin sensitivity in the myotubes like a day later or something? It's possible. I, I have. I'm yeah. not aware of the work directly. Um, mm. But clearly you can stimulate the cells in the dish with electrical pulses and you can, yeah, you can, you can, you can exercise the tube. Yeah, we know, tried to do that. Yeah. Once. I mean, yeah. so the, so I guess what you're trying to say is that you can exercise away the insulin resistance. And I mean, you know, at least, you know, John Palazzi and Mark Rogers did a study years ago where they brought in people that are um, having impaired glucose tolerance or people with type two diabetes and they had them do acute exercise, one bout of exercise for an hour, and then they had them exercise every day for a week, and they measured glucose tolerance. And um, these individuals had a really robust improvement in glucose tolerance mm -hmm. after one week of exercise. And there were a couple individuals in the cohort. It was a small sampling. I think it was about nine people. Two of these people didn't really improve their glucose tolerance as well as the others. And the conclusion there was that they didn't really produce a lot of insulin. Their, their insulin production was low. And uh, I think what John and Mark concluded was that, you know, in this case, if your islets aren't able to produce insulin, you don't benefit as well from the exercise as somebody who actually still is able to produce insulin and they become more insulin sensitive. So I think, you know, if you are early in the course of the disease mm. or if you're pre-diabetic, 
I think the exercise can really work to help improve insulin sensitivity in muscle. But it may be that if you become late into the course of the, of the disease, it's very difficult that exercise can completely restore insulin yeah, sensitivity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, as well. Yeah. The, the uh, insulin secretion side of it. Yeah, yeah. But exercise does a lot of really important things. Oh, yeah. It improves your cardiovascular fitness. It improves your strength. It improves your coordination and flexibility. So, I mean, I think exercise should be in everybody's program. But the extent to which exercise can cure you from diabetes. Um, exactly. I'm not sure that there's evidence that it can completely do that. So we have to keep that in mind. Yes. And even, even if you do have diabetes at quite a, you know, significant level that, um, mm -hmm. that, just, that you're not going to get improvements in insulin secretion, for example, it's, it's going to mean you less, need less drugs, less insulin, less, That's right. which is agents, good, you know, which is great as which well. Which is good. Now, the but, other thing I, I was, but I have to say, I take, I, I think it's really important for people to understand the genes really do affect our um, risk for diabetes, mm -hmm. for heart disease, for the development of obesity. Genes matter. Yep, yep. Now, the other thing I was thinking was um, how we're talking about how uh, having diabetes can mess up your um, circadian rhythms or vice versa. Well, the other thing is, is you know, mucking around your, your circadian biology can, can cause insulin resistance by, for example, shift work, which we touched on a little bit mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. So we did a little bit on this and it was quite interesting. And we did four days of um, just switching. So, you know, people mm -hmm. either awake at day, day or night and we actually matched, matched the food intake, matched the sleep and everything, and they became insulin resistant. So, mm -hmm. so that's another thing that, that, that messing up your circadian rhythm can cause insulin resistance as well. I'm not sure if you've looked at that at, at all. Or, um... I mean, I haven't, we haven't looked at that, but I mean, clearly that is really a very interesting um, observation. Um, mm. And think if you are at risk of developing diabetes and you're a shift worker, then that's probably going to be an exponential risk, right? It'll make it even worse. I mean, other yeah. diseases have been linked to this. I mean, cancer has been linked to this shift working as well. That's true. That's true. Yep. All right. So what about, I know the other thing you've looked at a bit here is um, timing of exercise. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. So do you want to tell us about that? So in terms of, I guess you've looked at uh, the effect of timing of exercise on insulin sensitivity, but then also maybe performance, even I don't know if you've looked at that that much, but um, yeah. The studies, we've only done a few studies on this. Um, the first study was um, uh, performed in men with type two diabetes and um, Mladen Slavich and Brendan Gabriel and Harriet Wahlberg Henriksen um, are part of that work. And there, what we did was we had these men wear uh, continuous blood glucose monitors. And they had a two week run in period. And then the men were assigned to either morning or afternoon HIT training. And they did two weeks of HIT training. And it was a Monday, Wednesday, Friday HIT training. And that they, they did that you know, two weeks in the morning or two weeks in the afternoon. And then there was a two week period of like a, like a, wa like a washout. And then they came back and they did, it was a crossover design. So they did the other, the other training. And um, my, the, the, the idea here is that the training should improve insulin sensitivity mm -hmm. and ergo improve glucose levels. And what we found was that in the afternoon training, we got that effect. The exercise training uh, in the afternoon was associated with a reduction in blood sugar levels in these men and an improvement in their evening sugars as well. But the surprise that we found, I thought it was very surprising, was that the expected result was that we should mitigate this peak in morning glucose. But we actually found that the morning exercise led to a further rise in blood sugar in these men. Mm -hmm. And that was more evident after the first week of training. Uh, after the second week of training, that elevation in glycemia was still there after the morning training, but it wasn't as pronounced. And that was curious, actually. We, we found that to be really curious. And so, you know, I went through the literature. Actually, mm -hmm. Fleming Deli was giving a talk. Yeah, and he was general. talking about Michael, some of Michael Kerr's work. Mm -hmm. And Michael Kerr and Jerry Raven published a paper in mm -hmm. men with normal glucose tolerant or men with type 2 diabetes from 1990. And they didn't call it HIT training, but it was no. high intensity exercise performed in the morning. And they were measuring blood sugar and insulin levels 
uh, continuously after exercise. And in the men with normal glucose tolerance, there was a blood glucose lowering effect of the exercise performed in the morning. But in the men with diabetes, they found what we found. There was an elevation in the blood sugar. And the men became more hyperglycemic after the morning exercise. Can I ask, how, how much after the exercise are you talking about? So uh, they were basically charting them out for the day, you know, so they they, okay. they charted them out for the day. And mm -hmm. so uh, what we found was it sort of, it was in the morning period after the exercise. Mm. And I think it's exactly what you said. I think it's, and this is what Michael Kerr concluded, it's catecholamines. Yeah. And so, you know, um, I, I feel that it, for people who have normal glucose tolerance, I don't think there's a concern. But for people who have type 1 or type 2 diabetes, it may be that there is an alteration in um, a catecholamine response. Um, and there's a mismatch between the production of glucose from the liver mm -hmm. and the uptake of glucose into muscle. Mm -hmm. And the liver is not able to shut off hepatic glucose production as, as rapidly. And therefore, the liver still produces glucose. Plasma levels rise. And, um, you know, there's sort of a disequilibrium there. And that's why I think the individuals have this hyperglycemia after the morning training. And I, I, you know, even after the second week of training, they were still hyperglycemic. So you could argue, well, you can train it away, but they were not having a blood glucose lowering effect even after the second day of training. So I think you got to have longer periods of time to train that system in. Well, that's really interesting because I had I've had a couple of people on talking about this sort of thing. So Michael Rodell, who's you know the talking about type one diabetes mm -hmm. and exercise, and talking about how they have to be, you have to think about their insulin because after high intensity exercise, their glucose overshoots, goes high up. There you go. But also yeah. uh, David Wasserman had, was on, and yeah, like when you do high intensity exercise, the, the liver keeps pumping mm -hmm. out the glucose. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is is the fact that you you don't really get that with the afternoon exercise as well. That's that surprises me. We that didn't get that with the that. after. So yeah, so I guess the message is obviously exercise is really good for all the reasons we talked about earlier: cardiovascular system, for the strength, for the flexibility. It's it's it, one should exercise, but mm. maybe if uh, you have type one or type two diabetes, maybe it's maybe an optimal time to exercise, maybe in the afternoon, if you're going to do high, high intensity exercise or strength training versus the morning. Mm. But, you know, mostly people can figure these things out for themselves, but that might be some guidance. Yes. So, so just to clarify again, in, in my own mind. So when you look at the, the, so the thing that people need to understand is the continuous glucose monitoring means you can follow the glucose every five minutes or pretty much whenever you want for like 24 hours, which, you know, remember, remember for we, two we weeks, did. basically. These yeah, things perfect. work for two weeks. Perfect. Yeah. So it's much better because remember we used to always just do clamp. You know, everyone is always doing clamps and oral glucose tolerance tests, which right. is still you know obviously important for different things. But if you mm -hmm. want to see what's going on, like for a whole day, after a day, two weeks, after a meal, after exercise. So just to clarify, over the whole twenty-four hours, um, were they still better off though from doing the exercise in the morning? The people with type two diabetes, like. Or was it, was it just going up after the exercise and then coming down lower? Yeah, they actually had elevated glycemia in the night too. And you could argue, oh. well, they exercised in the morning. So how could their blood sugar be higher at night? And and that, I mean, again, we did an average over the whole week, but um, their nocturnal sugars were higher. Wow. And yeah. it might also be, it may be, and I don't, we have to probably test this. If you're not really accustomed to exercising, because these people were exercise naive, and you start um, having to modify your lifestyle around, you know, getting up a little earlier to go to the gym, to kind of get all your stuff together. That's mm, a bit of a stress on top a of a stress. stress. That's true. And so yeah. it might be that, you know, just even that was maybe they didn't sleep as well because they knew they had to get up early and get to the gym. I don't know. We have to look into the behavioral things around mm. exercise. That's true. There's a lot more going on for folks than just getting on a bicycle and exercising. It's all the stuff around it. So, I mean, the bottom line, I think exercise is important. Any exercise mm. is better than no exercise. You know, there's a study that came out not so long ago from the UK Biobank, and they showed that people who exercise between, I think it was uh, 10 o'clock and four o'clock live oh, I longer. Saw that. I saw that. And people who exercised really early in the morning or late in the afternoon, late in the evening, didn't do as well. But <laughs> people who exercise, but, but, but. Mm -hmm. They, anytime you exercise was absolutely better than never exercising. Exactly. So first of all, any time of the day was better than not. But if you exercise between 10 and four, you still were better off in terms of longevity and you, you, you were better off. 
I, I remember thinking the people that exercised early and the exercise people that exercise late maybe don't sleep as much. But um, I didn't check the paper, but I'm sure they probably control for that. I mean, they were really clear to say that any of the time of day that you exercise was better than not exercising, but you could optimize the benefit of the exercise by exercising during the, you know, 10 to 4, 10 you know, to the four. daytime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I was just thinking if they weren't, if you're exercising like at six in the morning, maybe you weren't sleeping much and that mucks up your um, <laughs> insulin sensitivity. But I, I'm sure they would have factored that into it. Now, I, I know you're getting a bit tight with time here. We talked about a meeting you've got coming up. Um, I don't know if you've looked, but people are going to be interested as I am. Um, about performance do you know much about um effective you know the time of day on exercise performance? i mean that's probably a question other people could really exactly. answer but i mean mm. clearly most of the world records are broken uh in afternoon evening competition than in the morning competition and um others can talk about that i mean i know john hawley went back and looked at records and found that most of the world records were broken in the afternoon but talked about Australian athletes. And before this last Olympic, the Australian swimmers started to train so that they could optimize their performance for morning performance because the time trials were in the afternoon and the finals were in the morning. And by just changing their training routines, they were still able to break a lot of records and do really well and get a lot of medals. So I mean, you know, there may be an intrinsic clock that's there because we have a waking period and maybe six hours after we're waking is maybe the most optimal time for us to be strong, right? I, I'm just mm -hmm. throwing six hours out there. And you might be able to train that in by getting up earlier and, you know, um, optimizing for that performance. All right, this is great. I was just wondering uh, about some other things. So what about, is there any sort of uh, signs of differences between the sexes in any of these sort of things we've discussed we have we actually have just completed a really large study with um a hundred individuals and half of these individuals are men and half are women and out of that hundred half of the individuals have type 2 diabetes and half have normal glucose tolerance and um we have published some of the data on the muscle transcriptome of the men and we're working up the data on the women right now. And one of the biggest things we found was that in response to an acute bout of exercise, one bout of cycling for 30 minutes at 85% uh, max heart rate, the um, people with diabetes, the men with diabetes, had a signature in their muscle that was more of an inflammatory response. Mm -hmm. And we were surprised by that. And it was more pronounced in the men with diabetes. And we've just looked at the data yesterday. I looked at the data in the females and the women. And we see the similar um, response in, in the women when they respond to exercise as well. That The women with diabetes have a more marked signature of um, an inflammatory response. And that might be a good thing because you have this inflammation and then you can have repair. Mm -hmm. And that might be one of the early changes that one has with exercise. And so we're, we're interested in that. And we're also interested in the epigenomic signature um, and how exercise might modify the epigenome. Um, that's an area of science in the lab that we're running in parallel with some of the clockwork. And in that work, we're also asking whether or not women versus men have a difference in the way exercise modifies the epigenome. Um, so in some cases, there's things that are very, very similar. And in some cases, you see some real differences um, between between the sexes. And we're, we're obviously curious about that. The other thing um, we're interested in, particularly in women, is, um, and I don't have data yet, but I'm interested in the question, women who are of a younger age, who are still menopausal and are, are, who, who are menstruating, and women who are of an of a mm. older age who are, are menopausal, and how how that you know, period of life affects the muscle's ability to, to adapt to exercise and, and the role of estrogens there. I don't have a lot of data, but we're, mm -hmm. we're interested in that. We're really interested in the, um, the genomics of skeletal muscle plasticity in the lab. I guess I was wondering that when you said there wasn't as many differences between male and female, I was thinking, well, I wonder if they were postmenopausal. So that's probably what you're thinking there, that I guess they'd be more similar if they're postmenopausal perhaps. Well, and that's the, the population that we have now is a group of 
men and women who are, you know, between 50 and 65, because the primary question has been exercise as a medicine to promote insulin sensitivity. Um, and so we're, we're, there we're doing a multiomic study where we're looking at the transcriptome. We have data now in-house from the metabolome, and we're putting that together, and also some post-translational modifications. So we're really interested in the layers of changes. Um, again, it's not one dimension. It's multiple things that are happening. Mm. Again, it's interesting. You know how you said uh, they're showing some sort of inflammatory response in the muscle, mm -hmm. and then you said earlier that these people that weren't used to exercise that had type 2 diabetes had you know uh, responses with their glucose that were a bit surprising. So I wonder if, as you alluded to, if they if they did more exercise, you know, I wonder if the same thing's going on. But I, but I, I well, guess it wouldn't explain yes. the morning and evening. It wouldn't explain the morning and afternoon though. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, you know, a training story, a training study is warranted. And I mean, the other is the modality of exercise. You know, so maybe you know you can imagine maybe low intensity exercise in the morning, high intensity exercise in the afternoon. I mean, these questions need to be addressed. And they're of relevance for people who have metabolic, cardiometabolic disease. All right. So just looking at the time here. So is there any uh, any controversies in the field that, that we need to bring up? Because sometimes, sometimes I have people on and they sort of say everything. And then later on you go, hang on, other people don't sort of think that way. Is, is it pretty, everyone pretty much in agreement on, uh, do you know what I'm saying? Sometimes, sometimes you might have someone on and they, they give you their side of it. And then later on, you realize there's, um, I think it's pretty uniformly accepted. And there's been a Nobel Prize that circadian biology has big effects on metabolism. And we're, we're looking at performance as well. So is that fair to say? Well, I, 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 the controversy, if you want to call it controversy, I always think that um, controversy is usually a sign that we just don't know enough about the biology, you know, mm. and um, there's a lot of different ways to ask the question. Um, so I think that it just is a sign that we need to know more. And I mm. truly don't think that it, it's not very all of what we do is <laughs> definitive answers. I mean, otherwise, question. yeah, I mean, mm. otherwise we should have put science away 10 to a hundred years ago. I mean, there, we're always learning new things. Exactly. And, um, and so to me, it's an evolution. And um, I mean, okay. So there's certain things that are settled science. I mean, I think exercise is good for us, you know, and um, do we completely understand how that's working? No, mm. we don't. Mm. And so you'd probably have people that say, well, it's controversial that exercise is good. You know, my, my this husband says he doesn't want to exercise. He doesn't believe it, you know? Okay. So there's a controversy between him and mm. me, but, yeah. but um, so I think there's more we can learn. Definitely. And um, I think to basically say that any one of us has the definitive answer is probably naive. And so um, particularly when you think about this with the circadian biology, we know that there's a lot of different aspects that can affect the clock. So the time element, um, you talked about diet, right. you can talk about specific nutrients, uh, you can talk about exercise, you can talk about the temperature. There's so many things that can affect this. So until we control all of that, you know, mm -hmm. it may it may be difficult to get complete clarity on on this, but that's the exciting thing about science because I think we're all we're all doing this because we want to know more about how these systems are working, whether it's circadian biology or glucose uptake or A and PK. I don't think we know everything about anything yet. No, and we don't want to be thinking we do either because obviously at one stage we thought the world was flat. Although some people, don't. <laughs> it's making a bit of a comeback, but. Um... All right. Yeah. So just before. Yeah. So, so I actually don't I, I, I don't look at things as being contentious, you know, or uh -huh. controversial. I think uh, that we just need to learn more and, and we can always understand biology better. There's a couple of people I've had on, for example. So we had someone put, talking about keto diets and, and exercise, yeah. and that's like a controversial thing. So if I had one yeah. person on, they'd say something, and then another person would say something else. I think this area isn't really like that. So just before. Well, I maybe you should uh, have them on together and then you can have a debate. I want to. I actually debate. asked them. They don't want to. Do I yeah. actually want to. Okay, just very f final. Is there any way we can just do a, a quick takeaway messages? So, you know, when you give a give a talk, you think there's a couple of things I want people to take away from the from the chat. Is there a couple of uh, two or three takeaway things? Yeah, I think. All right, one thing I would say is that many of us are reductionists, and we look at one molecule at one time. And I think biology is a lot more complex. There is a whole orchestration of um, signaling pathways and post-translational modifications and, and gene regulatory processes that are, that are going on. So mm. it's complex. 
And we also look at snapshots. Most people look at one little snapshot and things are changing over the course of a day and, you know, a couple of days. So we need to, we need to really look at the dynamics, especially when we study metabolism, we need to look at the dynamic changes that occur. And we kind of have to take the blinders off and look beyond one molecule, one pathway, one time point, mm -hmm. because it's very complex. And um, that is exciting because we now are all getting tools in our hands to be able to get um, an understanding of the complexity and trying to look at the four dimensions of metabolism and how that affects our, our risk for disease and our ability to um, prevent disease. So I think this is a really, really cool time that we're in right now. What are the four dimensions? Well, I mean, time is for sure one. Mm -hmm. Space is another, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what, what, what is it going to be temperature? You know, you can have that as well, because you mm. can just put that into a reaction that can catalyze things. Uh -huh. um, uh, space. Yeah. And Where are things biology. located in the cell? I mean, you study AMPK, mm. you grind up your cell and you measure Absolutely. AMPK. But where is the location of AMPK in the cell? Tell me about that. Most of us don't even know that. We just grind up a biopsy, throw something on a gel and say it's changed. Exactly. So I had Neil Zortenblad on here talking about muscle glycogen and fatigue and things. And, and you need to know what's happening in the different compartments of the cell. Location matters, right? Yeah. Location, location, location. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming on. And I'm glad you said that at the end with the takeaway because we are, it's, everything is integrative. We are very integrative and exercise mm -hmm. is integrative physiology at its best. So I appreciate your time and uh, thanks again. See you. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.